Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are delighted to have you here, and we're certainly delighted to have Dr. Lynn Bowley from Delta Rest today with us, who is kindly going to, you know, um, present to us um, a very interesting webinar on understanding disease transmission and health risks through water systems. So we're delighted to have her here with us today. We're delighted to have an internal and external audience, and I want to give you a little bit of background on Dr. Lynn Bowley. Lee is, she's a scientist in water and health ecosystems interlinkages. She has an extensive experience in health and environmental impacts of water resources development, agriculture and domestic water use and management, ecology and environmental control of water related diseases, multiple use of water services, the water energy food nexus, water quality and ecosystem services in agroecological landscapes. Um, so she also has an extensive uh, experience in leading many international multidisciplinary research projects on improving planning and management of water resources that depend on health and environmental sustainability. So I'm delighted to have you with us today, Aline, and we would very much like to uh, pass the microphone to you and start the very interesting session. Thank you. Welcome to this presentation. Thank you very much, Coral, for inviting me and thank you for your lovely introduction. I will talk to you a little bit about disease and health risks associated with water. And this is topic is uh, growing in attention globally and also within Deltaris. Let me first introduce you to Deltaris. We are a water and uh, underground research institute based in the Netherlands, but also with three offices in Asia and elsewhere in the world. And we are a not-for-profit organization and we share our results as widely as possible. And you see a few um, uh, data here below. So straight to the topic. As I said, it's, it's an interesting topic that that's grown in importance globally. Now, even though COVID-19 is an airborne disease that is transmitted through contact with each other, water plays a key role. We need water to keep our hands clean. We need water to keep our environment clean. We may be deprived of sanitary facilities because of the risk of virus transmission. With the quarantine, people may eat more takeaway and there will be more garbage. We've seen this in a number of countries already. On the other hand, the lockdown may have good impacts on water quality. And finally, some water players like the International Water Association, they see the COVID crisis also as an opportunity to ask for more attention to water and the links with, between water and health. And then, of course, there is the potential of measuring and monitoring COVID, the coronavirus in wastewater treatment plants and in sewer systems, and use this to predict potential outbreaks. Even airborne diseases have a link with water. But here we will focus on those issues that are more directly related to water. And we'll do this roughly in three groups, looking at uh, pollutants, the chemical side, we look at microbiology, then we look at uh, vector-borne diseases, and finally, we look at how we can jump from these to predicting the health burden. So why would we look at health? Normally we work on SDG 6 clean water and sanitation. And we have links with the aquatic ecosystems that are under SDG 15. We have a link with climate action. If we provide water for irrigation, we're also looking at SDG 2. But we do want to increase our impact by in at least not negatively affect human health, but ideally have benefits for human health and well-being. So looking at the many linkages between water and health, we can put them in a map like this. For instance, you see vector-borne diseases related to agriculture. Think of the link between malaria and irrigation. Cities have been mentioned uh, and discussed by my colleague Franz in the previous seminar. But if you want to make a city climate resistance and you build blue or green infrastructure to relieve the heat stress, you, as a municipality, you want to look out that you don't create a health hazard by creating breeding sites for mosquitoes or getting a rat problem. And so you see many different issues that we'll one by one discuss in this webinar. At Deltaris, we try to understand this by looking at the driver's pressures, state impact and responses. Drivers can be population growth, but also inequalities in the world. and 
pressures are then the emissions that come from agriculture industry and cities but on the right side the people side exposure and the way the water is used is very important so the left side then leads to it leads to polluted ecosystems and on the right let's say polluted people intoxication or water related diseases and eventually this may again impact the entire ecosystem threaten water supply and affect livelihoods now from the water side we can think of responses to all of these while the public health side normally addresses the human state it affects diseases and to some extent prevention but responses sometimes have the advantage that they can address all these steps in the impact pathway and of course a big driver to all of this is climate change climate change affects how polluted water is getting more polluted how people are exposed more to water how we need more storage of water and how our dependence on water increases so as i said we're going to look at three groups and uh, plastics is a separate one that'll come back actually in all the groups and we relate this to the watery environment, the surface water, but also the below water, where the water comes from. Normally, we also look at the marine environment, but for this presentation, we focus mainly on fresh water. So Deltares has a huge experience on working on the fate and transport of chemical and even uh, organic compounds in the water and subsurface. But we're now expanding this into looking at water-related infectious diseases, trying to use our knowledge on microbiology and pathogens to develop early warning systems and get to a prediction of the health burden and use this to set priorities and eventually arrive at co-management of water and public health. Type of pollutants, they come, as I said, from industry, from agriculture, from cities, and there's waste. We then look at the emissions. How do we do that? Looking at these topics by monitoring, for instance. We monitor in the environment using passive samplers. These are not more than silicon flaps or disks that we put in the water for a longer time. And this enables us to measure not at one single point, but over a period of time so that you can measure even compounds that are even there for a very short time. And this is not typically a high tech thing that can be applied in the Netherlands only. We've used it in Bangladesh, for instance. You see here a picture from the Meghna River, and it's actually a very cheap method to put these in. Once you get the rubbers out, you can analyze them and find hundreds of substances on it. And this can be done locally. We've trained people in a laboratory in Senegal, for instance. Once we know a bit more about the compounds the, through measurements or through other databases, we get into modeling. And all our tools are open source. And these help to visualize water quality aspects. And these, in turn, can help water managers. And these come together in a global model and data monitoring platform where we combine our own measurements with external data sources. These come together in a platform and then provide online water quality services, sometimes very localized, sometimes more global. An example of an application, again, is in the EU funded project Solutions, where we combine models on hydrology with emission assess estimates to determine the fate of these compounds in the river basins in Europe, combined with exposure of people and the known ecotoxicity of certain compounds, you can then go towards calculating the effects on people. And this is sometimes a bit more complicated. We still lack some knowledge on that. So this is something we are continuously working on. An interesting thing about this model train is that the approach can now be also used for new substances. So this is not a, a product that is there and then, okay, we know it for certain substances. If a new substance comes up, an emerging compound, we can use it. Oh, here for plastic, you can see how we look at all these to understand what is happening. Where is the plastic coming from? Who are the polluters? And 
once the plastic is in the water, what gets out of it? There's all these chemicals leaching from plastics into the water. Again, we model this. The, we model the macroplastics, but also the compounds and then see what does it do to the ecology? What does it do to human health? I will get back to that later. And then try to come up with solutions, such as you may have heard of this, the, the bubble screens that are uh, applied here and there in the Netherlands. So in microbiology, we then zoom into the pathogens. And these can be bacteria, viruses, but also algal blooms. And for instance, uh, algal blooms are interesting because they have a link to eutrophication. Eutrophic water has more algal blooms and these then can release toxins, often under the influence of pesticides in the water, for instance. So that's another interlinked one. Here we have a strong link to water supply and sanitation because, of course, human waste is an important source of pathogens. And there's a link uh, with antimicrobial resistance that we study separately here. We also want to look at the emergencies. What happens with a flood? How are people exposed to what, where, and what is the health risk? So we've developed this conceptual framework to show what we're doing and where we are going from measuring the concentrations in the sources, calculating the water and surface quality, and eventually predicting, predicting the infection risk and developing prevention. See if we can come up with recommendations throughout the transmission chain. Another example of uh, how we monitor here is that we make use of the on-site detection of DNA using a device uh, mobile qPCR. And this is interesting because in Europe there is the bathing water directive and all waters that are known for uh, uh, recreational use, they are monitored every other week in the swimming season for water quality and sometimes more frequently. But if you have an event, like for instance the Amsterdam city swim, you want to know the day before, is our water clean for swimming. And in 2018, we were asked by the municipality to do a test there with our mobile devices. And we found that unfortunately, uh, water quality wasn't good enough. It had rained the day before and there were simply too many bacteria in the water. So this event with thousands of swimmers had to be cancelled, unfortunately. So this is also suitable for other areas. We've uh, applied it to measure eDNA in the Sitarum River in Indonesia, where you can see that in uh, location one, that's upstream, there's much more biodiversity in the water than in location six, Bandung City, where there's much more pollution. So that is another way of application of this eDNA too. So here we combine it in the forecasting of bathing water quality. I mentioned this already before, but this is also applied in other countries outside of Europe. We look at stormwater overflows, but we also use the weather forecast and water flows into our model and sometimes satellite data as well. Bring these together with the real-time monitoring and then come up with actual advices that can be followed and are ahead of the regular measurements. Another example of monitoring is by using people, average citizens who are interested in working with us. We did a couple of projects in the cities in the Netherlands where people were equipped with a toolkit and they could make their own measurements of the water. Kids could do it and they got a small test kit for E. coli. And the interesting thing, normally citizen science is looked a bit at, well, it's interesting to get participation, to involve people, but scientifically does it really add something well in this case it was very interesting because we got people to measure a couple of days after each other so then if you look at the graph if we would have measured only on the 5th of august we would have thought oh this is very clean water but now we've seen a couple of spikes and you see that there's a lot of water quality difference so this is something that we found through citizen science. 
A very interesting and important topic is antimicrobial resistance. As the world uses more drugs and medication, more of this gets washed into the environment and antimicrobial resistance spreads. We actually don't know that much about what happens in the environment. So we're looking into that. We've seen that water treatment plants are crucial in this because they combine flows from usually from cities, but also sometimes from agriculture, where there's high use of antibiotics. And in this environment, you get a mix of resistant genes, medication, and rich manure, and there's then interchange. The resistant genes jump from the host organism into environmental bacteria and from there spread on further. We try to understand how this works and how we can make map how the microbial resistant bacterial go from hospitals into the environment. And we do this currently in three cities together with local medical partners. Coming back to plastics, if we look at the health impacts, um, I've mentioned before this, this leaching of chemicals, but of course the tiny bits of plastic are not are toxic on ingestion. You don't want to swallow plastic, and yet we do. We get a lot of micro and nano sized plastic particles into our bodies. And what we've seen is that the large pieces of plastics, as well as the small ones, are lovely substrate for pathogens. Bacteria can thrive on these pieces of plastics and then are happily transported with the river flow out into the ocean and everywhere. Also, um, if we have plastic containers on land or we have plastic bags in a river, these provide shelter for mosquitoes and other vectors of disease. They protect them from, from predators. So reason to more, the more to really zoom into these, this role of plastics as a vector for pathogens. And this is a picture from Indonesia where we are taking samples. Uh, in addition, we also look at the impact of ingestion of plastic by providing medical researchers with plastic that we have uh, taken from the environment. The third topic is the vector related diseases. It's the vector-borne diseases that are directly transmitted by mosquitoes and flies, but also the related diseases where snails or rats play a role. This is largely linked to the presence of water and to a lesser extent to water quality. So it's mainly where you have water, where people get in touch with water, there you can find these diseases. So I mentioned the example of the cities and irrigation, but there's also a huge link with climate change. And in Europe, we see that vectors that you in Asia are very familiar with, for instance, Aedes mosquitoes are slowly invading Europe and may bring with them viruses that previously weren't here. So we're looking here at to see, can we turn the buttons on this complicated figure? How can we influence the drivers by changing climate, no climate we can't change, but that's a given. But can we change our farming practices? What if we do business as usual or can we change it? How can we predict tipping points? When can we expect an epidemic or a pandemic? Another role we can play in is in, for instance, uh, a disease like malaria that's been fought heavily uh, since uh, the 90s with increasing funds available. But now that in many countries malaria goes down, the cost per case gets higher and the health sector turns to other sectors to see, can you help us go towards elimination of malaria? Another example, and this is actually where the whole one health thinking comes together. One health is where you have animal health, human health and environment health coming together. And we have a consortium that looks at the many dams, one health, initially in Africa, where we were triggered by the relation between malaria and dams. But then we thought, well, we can look at the entire range of costs and benefits of dams. 
and as we are talking to partners, they say, well, you shouldn't do this in only Africa. Let's expand this study into Asia because a lot of dam building is going on there. And dams there too have all kinds of impacts that we are not always aware of, despite formal requirements for health impact assessments. Still a lot may be missed. So now if we go to the prediction of the health burden, Immediately you see that this slide is different from the other ones. With the other ones, we had more under pressure and state. Now here we have most under impacts. And it's useful to distinguish between the direct health impacts, the pollutants, but also the impacts of floods and drought, where people have too much or not enough water. And there's the indirect impacts, such as the changes in infection risk to AMR, but also the vector-related diseases. And if you talk about floods, then you have to incorporate even issues like mental health, as well as, uh, for instance, affected crop yields. So here it's about the people. Again, we do consider the emissions from industry and cities, from crops, from livestock, from aquaculture, from domestic houses in the rural areas. And then we have exposure. People are exposed to this water and incidentally doesn't make much of a difference, but they're exposed to it every day. Now, what does that mean? Well, we try to go back to this train of models and our global water quality modeling suit and try to add a health impact module by looking at exposure, by monitoring the concentrations, and then trying to assess how much of this affects people. And now a new challenge is, of course, to add the viral defector borne diseases to this. But we start with working on the what we can monitor in the water quality models, the chemical and the microbiology. So we started applying this to the issue of floods. Now, if you look at the graph below, you see that most people focus on the direct casualties of a flood. And that is considered the number one health burden of floods. But actually, as people start drinking, get exposed to, to the flood water, they get exposed to pathogens, their drinking water supply may be affected. There may be cholera outbreaks. And later, even, you may get an increase in um, mosquito-borne diseases or leptospirosis, Wiles disease, as the water recedes, but still some water stays behind. And there may be even more fatalities later on because of secondary effects due to the exposure to chemical contaminants. There may be birth defects. There may be the impact of stress. And of course, there is the whole issue of people living in shelters and crowding. Again, you may get corona and diseases like that. And these may lead to more burden of disease over time. So what we try to do is to use an approach that is uh, called FIAT, that is used in flood risk assessment. And some of you may be familiar with the Sendai framework for uh, humanitarian aid. And what you first do is take population maps, combine these with flood maps, and then you can calculate the susceptible population. Then here in the example of cholera, you see how are they exposed to the cholera bacteria through, for instance, overflown sewage facilities and do they recover, recover, etc. And here we, this is how we try to build up the model. So let me summarize for you problems related to water. They are interlinked. They are uh, linked to population growth influenced by climate change, urbanization, and other drivers. But we want to understand better by using, for instance, this. And if you want to read more about it, we've uh, prepared a background paper on how to apply this to water-related health issues. We tried to use innovative monitoring, measure, quantify, model, then predict, and finally assess the impact. 
And after that, along the chain, go to responses, where we want to co-manage water and public health and come to healthy agriculture, sustainable and healthy water supply and sanitation, a good understanding and getting mitigating options for how to deal with plastics, understand algal blooms and warn, have better urban design, as explained by my colleague Franz, and have a better understanding of how flood and disease interact and what we could do about it. So just to summarize for you again, the tools we've briefly discussed, these are actually ready to roll and we would be very happy to partner with you on any of these and also on the development of further tools, be it specific for Asia or elsewhere in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aline. That was a, a tremendously interesting presentation and extremely broad, which is very exciting because then it really gives us an overview of all your understanding and efforts and potential tools for application. So I would like to invite everyone now to really uh, come in with any questions that uh, they might have. And you can do that by uh, putting them in the chat box in writing by raising your hand. And, uh, you know, we really look forward to the discussion. So I can see already in the chat box that thanks to Vicky, we have a question already. And so, you know, Vicky, if you would like to come in, uh, otherwise we can read it from there. Thank you. Well, the, the question is, according to the chat box, it says, in relation to rain as a water source, what is the trend of rainwater quality in different parts of the world? Thank you, Aline. Rainwater quality. Now, that's an interesting. I, I must admit that I'm not very familiar with that one. I, I know there is... Uh, there's been the the issue of acid rain in the in the 1980s, but other than that, I'm I'm yeah. We tend to consider rainwater as pretty clean. So I'm sorry, that's not uh, really what I know very well. Thank you, Aline. Um, Yele, um, I see you have raised your hand. Would you like to come in? Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Aline. Very fascinating, actually, how you bring all these different elements together. But it also sort of brings me to, to one question then. I mean, if you do work on modeling, you quite often see the more parameters you have, the more degrees of freedom you get, the more uncertain your predictions are, for example, on the fate and then the diseases and, and, and the effects. So I saw, on the other hand, that you also include a sort of citizen science in there. Do you, do you already have some example of combining let's say the predictions with what was measured and how do you include, for example, the citizen science in, in, in there? Uh, because those are, like you said, maybe a little bit less accurate, but, but still still quite valuable. And secondly, do you have a bit an idea of, of how this propagation of errors is and, and how, well, how wide the, the intervals of confidence uh, become? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jelle, for your question. Yeah, and let me think. An example of, of combining citizen science uh, with measurements is, for instance, in this uh, PACT project that I mentioned, the One Health uh, Prediction of Tipping Points of Arboviruses in the Netherlands, where we use, um, for instance, on mosquitoes, we use the mosquito radar that has been um, recently released in the Netherlands. That is a typical example of uh, um, citizen science where people can just report yes or no I or I have a lot or no problems with uh, with mosquitoes and this is then uh, matched with systematic uh, scientifically reliable measurements of mosquitoes so we have both in parallel and then after a period of time we match the two and see if there's a link and see if you can use one as an indicator for the other perhaps. So that is one way of going about it. And that is also what we do in, in the water quality measurements. We always link it up with our own measurements in, in parallel. Now, as for the degrees of freedom and, and the uncertainty in modeling, yes, of course, that is an issue. And it all depends on the scale where you want to do your predictions on. Of course, uh, larger timescales are by definition more insecure. And 
we tend to there develop tools that are uh, different. For instance, in dealing with, with climate change, and that my colleague will talk about more in another session, my colleague Marjolein Hansnout. In, in climate change, we also have participatory approaches where you talk with the policymakers and see, well, what if? So you get more into a what if scenario because you cannot predict it exactly. And in other cases, you do have to be very precise. And then usually you take your area smaller. But for a more detailed answer to this question, maybe this is something we can follow up afterwards. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Yele. Um, we have more questions in the chat box. Thank you to everyone for typing them. Uh, we have the next one coming from Mariana Pereira, and she's asking, in relation to water storage, what are the main threats to human health? Thank you, Elaine, and thank you, Mariana. Well, thank you. It's, it's uh, again, I have to say, it depends. It depends how big the water storage is where the water storage is and what it is used for. In my earlier career, I looked at water storage in Africa, for instance, but also in South Asia. And we found that there's a lot of malaria mosquito breeding around reservoirs, for instance, or the tanks, as they call them in South Asia. There may be schistosomiasis, uh, snail where snails play a role around uh, water storage. In the Ethiopian highlands, we found a link between malaria and uh, small scale water harvesting ditches. These were really small, like one meter by 30 centimeters or something. And these were very important mosquito breeding sites. Another issue with water storage is the algal blooms, especially if these waters are polluted with manure or fertilizer and you get a eutrophic situation, you may get a lot of algal blooms. And some of these algal, algae have the cyanobacteria actually, they uh, produce toxins that are toxic to fish, to mammals and including to people. And the disadvantage there is that you can't cook the water to get rid of it, you will still have the toxins in it. So these are main issues related to water storage. Thank you. Thank you, Aline. Um, I see that we have Shulin Kay, which uh, our colleague who has his hand up. Uh, Shulin, would you like to come in? I, yes, I was just going to type up. But, uh, hi, Aline. <laughs> How are you? Hi. Hi, Tsai. Uh, say goodbye when I run away from there. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you are working on some very interesting stuff now. And um, I, I have a specific question regarding this uh, uh, flood pollution and hair aspect. That, that's a very interesting, interesting uh, that, uh, um, uh, sort of slide that you showed. And we have a project uh, that we are trying to, to work on this. Uh, and and then my questions are, are sort of like, do you already have like an operational tool to link these three aspects? And, and do you have example solutions or projects, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, anywhere you, you worked on this kind of integrated solutions? Thanks. On, on the water quality, you mean? Uh, that's, a, that's like a flood protection, uh, pollution control in the same river stream, and also, you know, like a related to COVID response and some sort of health issue. But yeah. They, 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 the two former ones, flood and pollution. Yeah, well, I think uh, in the Sitarum River, we're we're looking at both many different issues. We are we are looking at plastic waste. We're looking at uh, pesticides in the water. We are looking at um, antimicrobial resistant genes. Looking at pathogens. And here we are trying to also collaborate with the authorities uh, the, who regularly do uh, clean up efforts. That is one example from, from Asia that I can give. I'm just thinking, yeah, and in, in, in relation to COVID, well, actually, though uh, the coronavirus is present in sewage water, the transmission pathway through water is only a tiny little bit responsible for transmission of the disease. It is so much less important than the face-to-face the -face transmission that that's why um, 
there is not much research into uh, the, the transmission through water and the role of sewage other than its role in predicting outbreaks. And otherwise it's, as I said in the very beginning, the main link between water and COVID is making sure that everybody has sufficient water and soap to wash their hands. I'm not sure if this has answered your question, but I'd be happy to follow up separately. It would be a pleasure. Thanks so much. Let's follow up on this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have more questions in the chat box. Um, we have uh, two questions from Luis Cruz. On the one hand, he's wondering about, um, aside from microbiological and physical chemical qualities of surface drinking water, what other parameters do you consider in determining the degree of pollution? And then he has a subsequent question on the link between climate change and the transmission of diseases in the water system. Thank you, Luis and Eline. To answer the, your first question very briefly, yes, we look at a, a whole range of, um, of parameters uh, in water quality. What I presented today is, is the links in water, the parameters in water quality that are related to human health. In addition to these, colleagues of mine are looking at uh, ecological aspects of water quality and looking much broader at the whole uh, interaction between the ecosystem system and uh, water quality and the various uh, macro and micro fauna and flora in uh, water bodies. A quick answer to your second question. Um, the link with uh, climate change is, is dual. There is of course the increased temperature in many parts of the world and pathogens generally thrive at a higher temperature. In some tropical areas, the temperature may be so high that there's a kill off. But in most countries, uh, there will be an increase in um, uh, pathogen proliferation. For instance, a mosquito lives shorter, uh, bacteria in the water multiply faster in higher water temperatures. Now, another link is uh, with the irregular weather. We get more floods, more droughts. Droughts make people more dependent on water. They need more water storage. And there again, you have new water systems that you may create in an area where previously there was no surface water. And there you have to be aware of what happens with this water. Are we creating new breeding sites or is this just um, safe water for use? And uh, irregular water is also uh, floods, and I've tackled that a little bit. It exposes people to all kinds of hazards. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Aline. Um, we have some more questions in the chat box. Next one comes from Lingtang Iwi, who thanks you for the presentation. And for Indonesia, he mentions, currently most of the water use comes from groundwater. and he. The question is, is there currently a groundwater quality modeling that is easier for the community to use? Thank you. That's an interesting question. Groundwater modeling to be used for communities. Uh, I am not sure. I have to be honest. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can check for you. I do not know this. Thank you, Aline. Um, thank, you, thank you for the next subsequent questions in the chat box. Next, we have Srinivasa Rao, who is wondering about um, the right institutional mechanism to comprehensively address the issue of uh, water quality monitoring um, because of the lack of coordination and the fact that sectors are not able necessarily to develop a responsive system, for instance, in India. Thank you. Thanks for that question. It is, it is often indeed uh, an institutional gap. Uh, where, is, uh, where does water quality sit and, and how is it addressed? And um, you could argue that, that um, integrated water resources management is a potentially interesting umbrella. And you could envisage uh, an integrated water quality master plan for a river basin and that could then uh, benefit from the existing collaborations in a river basin between sectors bring these together 
make sure that industry and municipalities are uh, involved because they can often be uh, uh, seen as the biggest polluters. And maybe they may be willing to think about solutions because they're also users of the river water and have an interest in keeping the quality right. So that is my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Next, uh, I see uh, our colleague Jeff Wilson would like to come in with some questions. Jeff, please. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Coral. Um, yeah, hi, Eileen. I've got two questions. I had never heard of the silicon rubber used to attract um, constituents on for water quality measurements. Can you tell us a little bit more about it in terms of how long you leave it there and what constituents or pathogens um, become attached to the sheets? And my second question is, perhaps um, could you give a couple of words on the uh, benefits of wastewater-based epidemiology for uh, this coronavirus? Thank you. Yeah, so on the, uh, our passive sampler with, uh, with silicon rubber, um, they're not very good for pathogens because uh, uh, the, the pathogens, they, they, um, they multiply and, and die off. It is mainly for organic and anorganic compounds in the water. Um, you can leave it, uh, yeah, anything from, from, from an hour to months in the water and analyze afterwards. So you can do an analysis and then, then uh, do a total complete analysis and it will yield you typically hundreds of compounds uh, of, uh, at one uh, of these uh, sampling sheets that's been in the water for a couple of weeks. Yeah, the importance of the role of wastewater monitoring. It's, um, we've heard from, from several uh, cities now, or for, from several countries now that they are starting to use this. So you would have to uh, monitor, not maybe at, at uh, water treatment plant, but at various, um, nodes in your sewage system to be able to distinguish between neighborhoods and then see uh, where the virus pops up and where concentrations of the virus increase. And then you could target those neighborhoods with, um, for instance, increased testing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aline. Uh, next question is coming from Noriel in the chat box. And the question is around integrated water quality modeling and reservoir management. And uh, the question is, what are the requirements or processes if you want to avail of this? Thank you. Get in touch with us <laughs> and uh, we'll see what we can do. Well, first we would, we would see what is there uh, for a given reservoir assuming you want to look at one reservoir of a, or a group of reservoirs in a country. Uh, see what we have there and then we would go about finding the main uh, emission sources, see what information we can find on them, uh, from them directly for instance, if they are industry or cities, and put that together in a model, uh, combine it with our uh, hydrological models and then the degree, as I said before, the degree of forecasting, the degree of detail that you want to get out is, is all can all be discussed and that determines what kind of models you will use and at what uh, grid density. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Um, we have a question from Manisha Bisht in India. And the question is around sanitation disposal and water bodies being a major challenge and issue. That, and, and, and more specifically, what effect does it cause to human and animals together? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is, it is a huge challenge. And of course, under the SDG 6 efforts, uh, sanitation has uh, received more funds and more uh, investments, but still it lags behind to almost all other investments. And we still have a lot to do in the world. Uh, till that time, it is a health risk and it is a, a threat to um, human health a bit more than animals. Though, of course, if you have a very high load of sewage or animal manure in a water system, it also gets eutrophic and even 
the fish would be affected. But many of these pathogens, uh, for instance, affect people more than, say, livestock. There are a few exceptions, like cryptosporidium or uh, Giardia parasites. They affect both people and livestock. But otherwise, um, the threats for people are higher. Thank you. Thank you, Aline. Um, next, we see that uh, our colleague Bronwyn Powell, um, she has a couple of questions. Uh, for you, Bronwyn, would you like to come in at this time? Um, certainly. My, my question is regarding the modeling and whether you are modeling health impacts, likely health impacts as well, from various levels of exposure to various water quality parameters and then also does the model is it able to predict the impact of various um, exposure for chronic and acute health impacts on people thanks for your question this is exactly what I, what we are working on now and we find that it's 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 quite difficult to do this because um Exposure being key, this is something you, you, you do not know and is hard to measure. If a river is polluted with pesticides, for instance, as we've seen in, um, in uh, Citarum, but also in other rivers, how often are people exposed? What is their ingestion? And it turned out that this was much less than what farmers get when they spray their field. So th these things are difficult, but there may be uh, substances that are much, much more damaging to human health, for instance, heavy metals and the degree of exposure of people uh, during floods to uh, heavily polluted water is, is uh, quite significant. So we are looking at, at trying to quantify this and, and going towards calculating the burden of disease for this chronic exposure. The, the, um, the not chronic, the more uh, incidental and urgent exposure is more for the, for the pathogens. So think of uh, cholera, for instance, or even uh, leptospirosis. Those are acute, um, often uh, localized outbreaks where we have uh, instantaneous, almost, um, well, very short term exposure and then uh, disease. But we'd be happy to work with you on this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eileen and Bronwyn. Um, next in the chat box, in the chat box, we have a question around possible ways to have safe bath and drinking water in island barangays, who, which have no potable water source aside from salt water desalina desalination. Thank you. Yeah, that is, that is very challenging and um, it's, it's my colleagues uh, in other departments are working on, on, on small islands and how you have to preserve this water lens under the uh, underground. And it seems very ambitious to try and also look for, for, for bathing water and, and recreational water. Um, but it's an interesting question and we may want to look into this and, and maybe think in the direction of not directly fresh water, but maybe brackish, something in between. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something we haven't uh, started working on, but it's, it's super interesting and I'm um, keen on working on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vicky has an additional question around the fact of whether the terrace is, does currently have a program working with water districts in case they need help with technical assistance on water quality monitoring, modeling, or other water related concerns. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, we do work with water districts. Uh, we work with them in the Netherlands, but also in other countries. And um, uh, yes, we absolutely do. And we have tailor-made products for water districts and water managers, yes. Thank you. I think we have one last question in the chat box at this time. And it is related to whether you actually see an increase in Anopheles mosquitoes in temperate climates. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. We do actually see in Europe there is some uh, Anopheles uh, coming up, but so far they are not vector Anopheles. So no worries as yet. Thank you. 
Thank you, Elaine. And uh, I am uh, aware of time here, and I want to thank everyone for the very insightful questions and Elaine for the very insightful responses. I would like to offer the chance to anyone else to either come in by uh, raising their hand um, or typing something in the chat box at this time. I see Yellen Shu Liang still have their hands up. If do, do you, either one of you would like to come in again? Well, I think I, I think that given the time, I think this is an, it's been a really really fruitful discussion and a very very interesting and very very interesting seminar. I think I really I'm really um, very uh, appreciative again to Aline um, and Deltaris from being here with us today, to everyone who's participated. We currently have 133 internal and external participants, and it's been a, a really fantastic discussion. So thank you everyone for, for being here, for posing the questions. Um, we are um, going to upload the presentation that uh, we have had in, in our Development Asia uh, website as well, and we'll be disseminating information around around the, the knowledge uh, sharing that we've had as well. And we really invited everyone here to keep, you know, being in touch so that we can keep thinking about these issues together. And again, extremely thankful for this incredibly uh, interesting and useful discussion. Thank you everyone, especially thank you, Aline, for being with us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to um, lecture to this interested audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. <laughs>